further trapped within the cell, what's going to happen to the number of positive ions present inside the cell? They're going to go up, so we're going to get more and more and more potassium ions. Is that a leaky channel? Or no, it's a gated channel, okay. dependent on the oxygen. And as that increases, then the cell depolarizes. This meaning the inside of the cell is becoming more positive. And finally, we reach a threshold for our voltage-gated calcium channel. So the voltage-gated calcium channels open when a significant uh, threshold of positive ions is reached. Calcium ions enter into the cell. And remember what happened when calcium ions entered into the synaptic bouton of our typical neuron? The synaptic vesicle fused. We had synaptotagmin and the synaptic vesicle fused with the presynaptic membrane and released the neurotransmitter. So same thing happens here. Vesicles containing dopamine fused with the cell membrane and dopamine is released and binds to the ligand gated channels of the sensory vagus nerves or the sensory glossopharyngeal nerves. So let me put this up here. All right. So here is the cell uh, dendrite area of our vagus nerve, and it has, let me make that bigger, and it has ligand gated channels, and dopamine binds to that ligand gated channel and it opens and probably sodium ions enter into the cell and if sufficient sodium ions enter into the cell dendrites they depolarize create a current that then opens voltage gated channels and we send a signal up the sensory neuron of the vagus or the glossopharyngeal nerve and that goes to the dorsal respiratory group. And you take more frequent, deeper breath. So the glomus cell is just the receptor, okay? And it makes great potentials. And it releases the chemical that then binds to the sensory neuron, okay? And that would be the sensory neuron of the vagus or the glossopharyngeal nerve, and that's how we get information from our peripheral chemoreceptor to the respiratory groups. So now let's, hold on just a second. So now let's say that we have someone with a case study this morning was pneumonia. Pneumonia causes a fluid in the lungs, the alveolar sac, the thickening of the alveolar wall because of the inflammatory process. So as the blood is flowing by the alveoli in the pulmonary capillaries, CO2 can't diffuse out. So the CO2 stays in the blood and these CO2 levels rise. We would see the effect on the central chemoreceptors as the PCO2 rises in the blood, it's converted to carbonic acid, and we would see a change in the hydrogen ions. If supplementary oxygen is not given, we may see a fall in the PO2. It may or may not fall below 60, but if it does, we would see a change. And so either this or that or both would affect the glomus cell. Okay? And then that would send information to our respiratory groups. Because it is a respiratory problem, we probably can't save, change it by just changes in respiration. We'd have to get rid of hydrogen ions in the urine and so on, as we'll see next in our next unit. Okay. 
Okay. So what would you expect to be a change if someone had metabolic acidosis? Let's say they had diarrhea and they were losing bicarbonate ions in the diarrhea and so they had normal hydrogen ion levels but because they didn't have the buffer, the unbuffered hydrogen ion numbers would go up. What would be the change in their respiration? Would they increase respiration or decrease respiration? They would increase respiration. Okay. Now let's say that um, they ate too many Tums. Their unbuffered hydrogen ion numbers have gone down. They are in metabolic alkalosis. So not enough CO2, not enough hydrogen ions, so more of their CO2 is forming carbonic acid to release hydrogen ions. So now their CO2 is lower. So what's going to happen to their respiratory rate? It's going to decrease. Okay. <coughs> That's so a third of, of our acid-base buffer lecture for our next unit. So we shouldn't need a lot of time, <laughs> Not all at one time. But I'll somebody around to make sure you breathe again. Okay. So I just have one more little chart here that kind of summarizes. Well, let's look at this. Uh, so if it is a drop in CO2, that's only going to affect your respiratory rate, respiratory rate if it's less than 60. Remember, normal blood coming into the lungs is a CO2 of 40. All right, but that's the venous level. So if we're at high altitude and our CO2 drops below 60, then that can be a stimulus to breathe. All right. However, it's going to depress the central chemoreceptors. It doesn't have enough oxygen to function. PCO2 doesn't do much to the peripheral chemoreceptors, but it's the major stimulatory factor in the central chemoreceptors. If it gets too high, the acid changes, cause the change of the chemoreceptors to not be able to bind the ligands and so on. And so it ends up not working if it gets really high. This is twice the normal venous PCO2, okay, um, and, and twice the normal arterial. And then finally, if there's an increase in arterial hydrogen ion, that stimulates only the peripheral chemoreceptors because it can't cross the blood-brain barrier in the central chemoreceptors. Uh, yes, it's on the old PowerPoint slide. Um, all right, so this is the slide that I wanted to end with. So if you decrease ventilation, all right, so you're not moving gases into and out of the lungs as rapidly or as deeply, then your PCO2 is going to go up. Your arterial PCO2 is going to go up. On the chemoreceptor side, that increase in PCO2 goes into the CSF and increases carbonic acid and hydrogen ions, and we activate central chemoreceptors. On the peripheral side, the CO2 is converted to carbonic acid in the plasma, binds to chemoreceptors in the arterial blood of the aortic and carotid arteries, and then those fire via vagus and glossopharyngeal nerves, and we also affect the respiratory sensors. So both factors can be involved, and we activate the phrenic nerve, intercostal nerves, and have more rapid and deeper breathing. Okay. Now in lab today, as I indicated, you're going to see how long you can hold your breath. I did it with just normal uh, exhalation breathing. But what happens if you hyperventilate? Hyperventilating is not panting. Okay. Hyperventilating is not <sighs> hyperventilating is <sighs> deep, deep breath in, in and deep quick. breath out. Oh, it's deep out. So you are not just breathing in deeper amounts of oxygen. The key factor is you are blowing off more CO2. So when the arterial blood reaches your central chemoreceptors, it is detecting low levels of CO2, fewer hydrogen ions in the CSF, and it interprets that as we don't need to breathe for a while. We need to hold on to those 
hydrogen ions or the person's going to become alkal alkalinic in their pH, too basic. And so you are inhibited from breathing until those hydrogen ion levels come back up to normal. There's a variation on that, but it could be part of that, okay? So, again, you can hold your breath. You should be able to hold your breath longer after you hyperventilate. <coughs> the problem with doing that to increase the time you hold your breath underwater is you, use up, you continue to use up the oxygen in your blood and your PO2 drops. Notice what happened to the drive to breathe in the central chemoreceptors. It's suppressed. And you lose consciousness before your hydrogen levels rise as your CO2 is rising. So you're unconscious, but you're still not breathing because your CO2 levels are still below what needs to be triggering the central chemoreceptors. And you're using, continuing to use up the oxygen, and now you're triggered to breathe as the CO2 levels rise, but you're still unconscious. You don't know that you're still underwater. <laughs> so your diaphragm contracts and your external intercostals contract and you inhale water. Okay? So the respiratory muscles are, are working, but instead of moving air into the lungs, you're moving water into the lungs. And you never regain consciousness because you never add the oxygen to that. Exactly. Okay, so that's the end of lecture content. And um, you're welcome to continue studying more on your own, but that's the end of what I will te be testing you on. All right, I have office hours tomorrow, so if you have questions or send me emails, all right, you have a quiz that closes tomorrow. Remember, quizzes that close the day before the exam close early so that you have access to the answer prior to midnight. So and it's it extra credit. Around 8 or 8 15. It's extra credit, too. And it's an extra credit one, so you're, you don't have to you grab that one for extra points. <laughs> All right, so let's um, take a break. I have the 